Our next talk is going to be rebuilding builders instead of trusting trust. Let's welcome Martin Schweighofer. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I, I get to speak to you again today, which is great. Um, who here is familiar with the trusting trust paper? Like, okay, I see some, I see some hands, but I don't see a lot of hands. Um, great. So my name is Martin Schweighofer. I'm a, I'm a PhD student uh, at Johannes Kepler University in Austria. And uh, for the last few years, I've been kind of uh, looking into security applications of NICs. And like at least for the last year, maybe, maybe more, um, that had to do with supply chain security. And actually, the contents that I'm presenting to you today, um, it's something that I uh, submitted at a, a workshop about supply chain security, and I presented it at that workshop as well, um, slightly modified version of, of this presentation, and I did that last week. And um, it's to me, it's really important. Like I, I really uh, believe in those ideas that I'm presenting to you today, but I'm also really curious what the Nix community is going to, to think of them, right? Um, so let's kind of, let's start out talking about what issue I'm actually like going to present about, right? Um, so in general, if we think about software, um, like not specifically talking about Nix, but usually if you distribute software. Um, if I get some compiled software from somebody, I usually have to trust the environment that this software was built in, right? And this is something that actually applies recursively. <laughs> so every bit and piece that's involved in that build environment of that piece of software that I actually want to trust or be able to trust, I also have to trust that. And this goes like back a lot of steps to some bootstrapping process or some <laughs> early version of some compiler. And actually, this is a huge problem because um, this trusting trust paper that like a few people said they were familiar with. It's like when, when Ken Thompson accepted his, I think, Turing Award, um, he wrote about this, and it's about, well, if you backdoor a compiler at some point, and then you, usually what happens with compilers is you use that compiler to compile another compiler, and that way, if you have some backdoor, it can like propagate through time and uh, can be used to like insert quite um, targeted backdoors, try to like evade detection. It's actually a, quite a persistent problem and there's real e examples of instances of this happening, right? Um, so it really raises the question of how can we trust our software supply chain if that's um, what we're dealing with. And Nix is a really good step in the right direction there because we have a lot of um, it gives us a lot of control over the build steps that we're describing in our, in our dependency graph, right? And what I actually specifically want to propose is, I want to present to you my idea of how we can um, push back this issue of having to trust the uh, build environment of the build environment of the build environment and so forth, um, push that back um, so that everything that's described inside of our dependency graph in Nix isn't um, impacted by, the pro by this problem more than absolutely necessary. Um, and the way we do that is we try to make the trust relationships of individual builders in our ecosystem as independent of each other as possible. Like that's the systematic way of approaching this problem that I'm proposing. And what that gives us is it, 
enables us to have like a distributed ecosystem of builders building open source components, and they can interact with each other, trust each other, but um, they should be able to act as independently as possible and, and evolve independently over time. And there's also like people working on other measures, not quite the same thing, but there's the in total framework, um, which inspired some of this work, but um, makes some different trade-offs. If you have specific questions about these related works, I have some slides prepared, but I'm not going to go uh, into them in detail. About in total, I just say, well, um, it's a supply chain security tool. If you have some project and you secure it with in total, what you do is um, you check you check a layout description of your software delivery pipeline, basically, into the project directory, and then you assign responsibility um, for individual steps of that pipeline to different parties, and you do that with cryptographic keys. So every party that's involved in the supply chain uh, has their own private key, and then you kind of verify this layout by checking if all of the involved steps were performed by an eligible party correctly. And Gideon is a different tool in that space which does reproducible builds, but it in contrast to Nix, it doesn't do the full dependency graph, it just does one step. But one advantage of that it has is it has probably better sandboxing because it uses a VM for that. Um, but the, uh, the biggest downside probably of that is of that tool is it's based on Debian packages. And so like for the one step we're investigating, we get good properties of, oh, we, we can reproduce this step and we know how we get from all of the inputs to the, out, to the output, but those inputs are kind of like binary blobs that we get from the Debian ecosystem. And so they are also working on transparency, but in principle, um, we just move the problem by one step and I actually want to go further, right? And then one related effort is also like the Trustix project. It's also a big inspiration for what I'm presenting here today. Um, and it solves aspects of what I'm presenting and I'm going to, to mention that when we get to that. Um, but also, it's kind of orthogonal, because I'm, I'm not going to talk about migrating from like signatures to transparency logs or something like that. I actually want to, um, I, actually don't, I actually want to focus on other issues. So first of all, like the starting point of all of this is again, like the properties of cloud build systems. You heard that in my first talk already. Um, there are specifically two properties that these systems have, and Nix is one of those systems. Um, they, look, they have some lookup mechanism that uses hashes, so you have some hash that describes all of the inputs for, for some build step, and you use that to um, cache the output or get the output from, from some cache. Um, so your, your input hash is some, some address for the output. And then it has hermetic isolation, which, which means it tries to isolate the build step from the rest of the system, so the rest of the system can't impact the build step. And then the core data structure um, that all of this is built on, I'm calling this like a trace map entry, but it's basically an input hash and an, and, and an output hash together. And I'm also introducing a, a dedicated data structure that we're gonna build on the, in the rest of the talk. This is the fundamental extension that I'm proposing that, that I think would be great if we would somehow integrate into the Nix ecosystem and then like the specific extensions built on that fundamental data structure, that's like, a different story. But we're gonna go into those as well. Um, I'm gonna like, present some use case of, okay, so what are we trying to accomplish? And the model of how we think about trust in this work. And then we're gonna go through a number of threats that threaten the integrity of our supply chain and we're gonna introduce a thread, and then we're gonna to try to add some data to this provenance log entry that I introduced uh, in order to mitigate the thread, and we're just gonna repeat that until the end of the presentation. Okay? Great. Yeah, so output lookup by hash. Um, we have some derivation that describes the set of inputs to our build step, and we can ex execute this to obtain some output, but we can also compute a hash that's, that is then characteristic for this input set and describes this input set. And we can also compute the hash of the output and then we have this data structure that 
uh, basically consists of the uh, input hash and the content hash, and the input hash maps to the content hash. So we use the input hash to look up uh, some entry in a like in a map, and the entry we look up is is the content hash. And this, um, yeah, this is how signatures um, in in Nix work. The signatures that we that we rely we rely on to um, reason about the trustworthiness of individual entries in our, in our uh, dependency caches. And the other property is hermetic isolation. Um, hermetic isolation says all of these hashed inputs, this is everything that the build step is supposed to see. It's not supposed to see the network. It's not supposed to see the rest of the system. On one hand, this pre uh, pre prevents tampering with the build step, so it um, deals with that. Um, but it's also kind of the, the thing that's essential in order to um, make remote building and caching trustworthy in these systems. So you could also define cloud build systems not by taking hermetic isolation as the second property, but by saying, well, there's remote building and caching, but then it would be insecure, right? Because <laughs> you have to really do the hermetic isolation correctly for the system to kind of be able to bear the load of actual usage. Um, and so I, tried to, I, I decided to base it on hermetic isolation. And everything we have in the input set is actually dependencies we want. It's our intended dependencies. And then there's two things we are, we, we are separating from the intended dependencies, and that's, I'm calling that the inadvertent dependencies. That's things we can't really get rid of. It's the kernel, it's the drivers. It's actually the cloud build system itself and coincidental dependencies that in a traditional system might also impact your build output, like things that are just laying around on the build host. All right, so that's cloud build systems for you. Is that kind of clear? I see some people shaking their heads, which is great. I'm really happy about that. Um, data structures. So now I said like the fundamental data structure that, that we use in order to communicate trust is this combination of input hash and content hash here. And uh, I call this a, a, a trace map entry. And this is like at the heart of cloud build systems. The other slide set I, I, I made with a PowerPoint, this one I made with LaTeX, so I wasn't able to use a, an emoji for the heart, which makes me sad. Um, but LaTeX is tough. We, we all deal with tough things in life. Um, and the thing that I want to introduce is this provenance log entry. And actually, it doesn't add much. It just says, hey, Instead of just like Nix does right now, what Nix does right now is sign the input hash together with the um, content hash of the mapped output. And this is basically what, um, what, the, uh, what those signatures are that we use to, um, to communicate trust. Um, in, in addition to that, let's add arbitrary provenance data, some mechanism that helps us add arbitrary data. Um, and provenance data means data about the origin of, um, of the output, like basically data about the build system. Because we have data about the inputs that are part of the um, intended dependencies, but we don't have any data about the inadvertent dependencies. And they do factor into the output. They just shouldn't by the design of the system. And so this is some cryptographically secured thing. It could be signatures. It could also be a transparency log like Trustix. And yeah, we want to use it to communicate trust. And it's the extension I propose. And it's supposed to be extendable. So you're supposed to be able to put stuff in it. Um, then now we need a trust model. If we want to talk about like these complicated issues of dealing with trust, we have to have some definition of, well, how does trust work in the way we're reasoning? And the basic setup here is, Let's have a set of public keys that we trust. I think if you're using Nix now, you're quite familiar with that. Probably you're trusting the, <laughs> the cache.nixos.org key, right? Uh, maybe a few others. Um, and uh, Trustix, at this point, we can point out, well, they already do something where they make it possible for you to have like more sophisticated combinations of, hey, let's trust specific builders in combinations and so on, right? And uh, we also want to do that. But one thing we want to do in addition is this additional data that we add, let's also uh, add the ability to add some constraints to that. Like, 
make the person or make the builder that's verifying is this trustworthy, this, this thing that I'm compute, consuming from a cache, make them reason about um, what's in the provenance data. And they use this basic setup, like each um, participant in the ecosystem uses this basic setup to make a binary decision of, well, I have this set of data, do I trust this mapping from inputs to outputs, yes or no? Um, and they're supposed to do this as independently from other builders as possible. And there are some examples we can give for how this could work. Um, like the simplest case is, let's just say we have some centralized model um, where we have one trusted party and everybody just says, yeah, let's trust them. This is the trivial case. A cloud build system can handle that um, without any extensions. And it's also arguably how Nix, how Nix packages works with the central caching infrastructure we have because we have this one key and we trust this key, right? And like, um, aside from that, like how, we do, how do we reason about these things? Um, a more sophisticated thing would be to say, well, um, as a user, I, there's three specific people I trust, and I want two of them to be in agreement about the mapping from inputs to outputs. And of course, if we want to have this kind of model, we have um, repro reproducibility as a, a prerequisite for that. Um, and a more sophisticated thing would be to say, well, let's, let's have a large quorum of build hosts, and let's just say they have to um, be in agreement to a certain degree, um, and they have to meet some criteria that is defined by this uh, arbitrary provenance data in addition, right? And th these are examples of trust models. Um, so what are we actually trying to do? We're trying to have a project that we have some flake file checked in or some other mechanism so that we have like a, determ a deterministic way of building a dependency graph. We use Nix to build that graph in memory. For each build step, we have some input hash. And then using that input hash, we want to be able to obtain trustworthy artifacts from caches. This is what we are trying to do. And the trust model of the user is supposed to ensure that the user, user only accepts trustworthy outputs from caches. So if we're building something, we only want to take in stuff that's trustworthy. And that's what we're trying to um, accomplish by stating who we trust and to what degree. And um, additionally to the building, we can also do verification in the same way because we can look at this cryptographically signed data and just see, can we reconstruct uh, every link in the dependency graph, um, like every link that's modeled in the dependency graph and have evidence of each one of those and do we, end up in the pl uh, do we end up in the right place? Do we, do we have evidence for each link? Um, and that's a kind of verification that's very powerful. It goes into the direction of having like a verifiable SBOM or something like that, right? And so an attacker tries to bypass this, like get past our reasoning. Um, and in the beginning of like all of the threats we're going through, we're still going to assume that all of the hosts that our specific builder that we're thinking about trusts are actually honest. So there's no malicious thing going on. They're just doing the best job that they can. And we're going through the first three threats in that way. And then we're going to switch gears a little bit and we're going to say, well, and, and still in that first situation, there might be untrustworthy um, builders in the ecosystem, we're just not trusting those, right? And then in the second part, uh, we're going to go a step further and say, well, what if at some point we trust a dishonest builder, somebody who's like some builder who's actually trying to deceive us um, or some builder that has a like unpatched vulnerability? Can we recover from that thing? So the first two threats, let's talk about those. And we're starting with the status quo of Nix today. So I said we have those signatures that verify individual entries in the binary cache, right? And I, I would say that those signatures were originally designed for transport security. So their purpose was to make sure that nobody can mess with what you get 
on the way from the cache uh, to you, right? So they are not an end-to-end -end thing. And so what they actually omit is they don't make any statements about where the output that you're consuming from the cache is coming from. You just know that the, um, that the cache trusts it. Why the cache trusts it, we don't know. It might have built it itself. It might have obtained it from somebody that it trusts. There might be some sophisticated system for feeding the cache. But um, this is actually just a variation of this trusting trust problem where, um, well, we, use, uh, we lose the connection to the original author, so we have to just trust how that host is configured and how that cache is fed. We just can't know it. We have to have some outside knowledge, right, about that. And the first threat is, well, if we get such a provenance entry and it's signed by somebody and has, it has an input hash and it has the content hash of the corresponding output, we don't know who actually signed this. So we don't know who we are trusting. Right? Like, not formally. We might know, well, I trust that the people setting up the infrastructure of cache.nixos.org or whatever, that they're doing a good job. But, like, there's no proof for us. There's no evidence. And similarly, if we want to reason about the reproducibility of some, of some output, right? Theoretically, we could go to two different caches and obtain two different signatures and think, oh, those signatures sh sh are signed by different people and they show me a relationship between the same pair of inputs and outputs. So based on that evidence, I could say, well, this is reproducible. But I actually can't because they might both be trusting the same party that did the actual build. So I don't know anything just from that evidence. And the way to solve that is really easy. To our provenance data, we just have to add some Boolean flag that tells us, well, I either, either as the signer, I, I, I either claim that I have built this myself or I don't. And if I want to analyze reproducibility, if this flag is set on two uh, signed uh, provenance log entries, I can say, well, those two people built this, got the same result, and this is reproducibility def defined based on evidence, right? So we're decoupling the building from the thinking about, well, what was the result, which is a, a nice, convenient thing to do, I think. And if we don't, like, if they don't claim to have done that, well, in that case, we just we don't lose anything, we just can't reason like that. Like, we can't do it right now, we will continue not to be able to. And then we get to a really tricky threat, and this one is actually related to dependency resolution. So, we actually shouldn't trust anybody but ourselves with dependency resolution if we want to make this work, right? I see somebody enthusiastically nodding in the audience. I think that's great. Um, in Nix today, let's, let's look at this. Uh, in, my, in my first talk, I already uh, showed this graphic. In Nix today, we rely on something called like deep, deep constructive traces up to terminal inputs. And what, what it means is, like before we do the build, we compute this input address of the thing we're trying to obtain from the cache. And this input address or this, this um, input hash depends on, on the input hashes of all of its dependencies and all of their dependencies and all of their dependencies. So we can pre-compute it before the build. But it's just dependent on all of the ingredients. And if the person who we are getting this from trust somebody that we don't trust. They just might get some malicious thing and have that be part of 
our closure of dependencies indirectly have that factor into what we get out of our build without us having any evidence of that. And this is an issue, right? And it, we can... Like, there's two ways of constructing these things. Um, one is how input address Nix does it, and one is how this idealized version of content address Nix does it that doesn't do any interoperability with input address Nix, but it just um, always resolves all of the dependencies, and my derivation then doesn't contain any uh, any of these recursive, recursively constructed hashes, it contains a bunch of content hashes. So we have a relationship of a set of content hashes manipulated in some specific way to the output we get from that. And that's a relationship between a resolved set of dependencies and the output produced by building that. And if we take the situation of um, input address Nix, this resolution happens by accessing the store because the path in the store is our um, input hash and it is dependent only on the build recipe which doesn't take dependency resolution into account but then the content that, that is there that is something concrete so resolution happened there so if we rely on a dependency in that way, uh, we rely on how that host resolves dependencies. And so what I'm saying is that actually, if we want to have these guarantees, independent of whether or not, if, if we use, whether or not we use input address Nix or content address Nix, semantically we have to check that we can build a graph that doesn't have any mismatched links based on these like constructive traces, so based on the content hashes, we get a properly formed graph. And that way nobody can uh, handle something that we actually didn't want to trust. Is that clear? It's a bit of a, a complicated thing. Um, so this is like this third thread is, is tough to resolve. But then, um, at this point, as long as all builders are honest in what they do, we have basically won. But this is not a realistic situ situation because we, we can't assume that, right? It's, it doesn't help us that much. If we actually want to have a distributed ecosystem, we can have a distributed ecosystem where everybody that you rely on is fully trustworthy to you, but that's tough because if any one of those people gets compromised somehow, like it takes you down with them somehow. Like, except for those consens mechanisms that you can rely on, so it's not that bad, but it's tough. But we can go further, right? Um, so thread four and five are like, what if a builder is dishonest? Or what if we change our mind about our own trust model? We want to have stricter criteria now. Or we discover some vulnerability. So we want to, what we want to do is we want to verify the software state of our builder instead of just trusting it. And if there is some vulnerability, and it is like the presence of this vulnerability is evident in the data we collect as part of, of the provenance data, then we can say, well, if we make the decision whether or not to trust this thing, we just say no, because we can see evidence of, the, of, of it being vulnerable. And the way we can accomplish this is, to this provenance log entry, we add a claimed source reference of the software state of the builder. So for the build step we're executing, there is the build host should conceptually have no influence of, on the build output. Because we're saying, well, these inadvertent dependencies, like, they should not make a difference to the result. But for sure they can. So let's just collect this evidence, let's 
collect this uh, source reference, and if this source reference is something like uh, a flake reference to a specific commit, we can make the whole graph that builds this system part of our dependency tree, which means in the same way we reason about our regular dependencies, we can reason about what's installed on our build host, and we can like permit or not permit specific things. And the way we make this information trustworthy is to say, let's um, use remote attestation, which, which is a mechanism where we're booting our builder, we're measuring the hash value of the thing we're booting, and this is related to secure hardware so that we can't manipulate this measured value. And we can then uh, create a cryptographic uh, like a cryptographic proof, a crypt cryptographic evidence for, hey, this is actually the software state that we booted, and uh, we can add that to our provenance data, and then somebody else can verify it. So examples of how this can work is like TPN 2.0 implementations can do this, Android can do this uh, with a feature called key attestation. Um, yeah, we do the key generation for our actual signing key in secure hardware, and then we have this mechanism attest, hey, this key was actually um, created in secure hardware, and when we used it to sign this derivation, um, these were the measurement values from booting it, and we can check that this matches what we, what we would expect. And as the nonce for this thing, we, we use actually the, the values from the, like the actual mapping and, and just the monotonically increasing counter. The, the mapping is, is the thing that links our attestation to, uh, uh, the mapping is the thing that links our attestation to the actual signature, and the monotonically increasing counter is nice because then we can like reason about, oh, I built this thing five times and got three different, uh, five different attestations, and they all agree, um, yeah. And then we verify this remote attestation. And that's like theoretically, like I haven't implemented this, but this is one way we can tackle this problem and try to um, get rid of transitive trust in the scope of what we describe with our cloud build system. Um, we link provenance data with our build steps and uh, we make the software state of our build hosts like very explicit and verifiable. And one important aspect of this is we really try to decouple the generation of provenance data from its verification. And I think that this is a really interesting approach for supply chain security. So there's a lot of things to do if we would actually want to implement this. There's performance implications because kind of every link in your dependency graph becomes like another subgraph, right? And like, we need a data format for this. And also, like, how do you bootstrap a system like this? And how can we make the necessary improvements so that the sandbox in Nix is strong enough that we can actually do this kind of thing? And I think this is the kind of project that it's not really something that an individual person can do. I think it would be great if we as a community could work towards that goal. But I'm really interested in what you think about it. And uh, that's my presentation. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. I already see some questions. So let's start here. Uh, yeah, first of all, nice talk, thanks. Uh, I'm working on some stuff related to this, and we should talk like I'm trying to make Nix images with predictable PCR values from the TPM <laughs> so that you know what the state of your machine is. That's before wonderful. Booting it. And I think that fits right in. That fits uh, right in yeah. this vision. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Yeah, and then my question is, how do fixed output derivations fit into this picture where when you don't, when the output hash of your thing doesn't really depend on the inputs of your derivation per se? Like, does that make these things difficult? Like, or does that affect anything? Uh, um, I don't think it does. I think that fixed output derivations are their own kind of uh, can of worms because I think semantically they are difficult and problematic but I would say that in the context of this specific work, they are, not, they are not really an issue because for fixed output derivation, first, 
you look at the, at the hash, do you have something that matches this predetermined hash? And if not, then you look at, like, do I have, like, can I somehow produce this? And then you would probably do a cache lookup. And, like, this works the same way as a regular derivation, I think. Thanks. Hey, um, I would like you to comment on a very specific application that you didn't quite touch on. Sorry? I, I'd like you to comment on a very specific application of this. Yeah. What was it called? Didn't, I'm going to mention it. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, thanks. In the case where there's a specific case where we can absolutely trust the builder. Yeah. And that's in a single business that's split between two business units. One of those business units is the builder. And in this specific case, the, the end code made by the software team and then built by the other business unit, yeah. we know absolutely, especially because of Nix's declarative build system, precisely what the inputs were, who the builder was, we can tell the exact steps in the build process and the code used to generate it. So in uh, high security applications, uh, medical applications, when an auditor comes in, I'm certain that this would decrease effort uh, in just auditing the whole system because they know precisely what happened, what the code looks like. So but that's, that would decrease costs. Nix is new and can support this declarative stuff. This sounds like a blue ocean to me. What do you think? So um, I th I'm not sure if I understand the question, so I'm going to just say a bit about it and we'll see. Um, so I think that if you have, like you can use, if you do this kind of thing, you should absolutely use incentives to your advantage. And if you have some isolated business unit and their job is, hey, make sure that inputs match outputs, for example, this already gets you somewhere. And uh, the work I presented here just gets you further because it uh, makes it so that those guys couldn't even lie, right? It may, would make it very difficult for them at least. Or it would, would mean that they have to tamper with the hardware or like do more sophisticated things. Th does that answer your question or does it help you like? I suppose I, it might be moot because one of the, any, company that needs to be audited could be required by some ISO standard yeah. to use another company's build tool. Uh, so the, the security yeah. does is very helpful. Yeah, uh, I, I, I think so too. I think Nix is very well set up to, to be a good, great solution in that space. And one aspect of this that's very important is like the automatability. Mm -hmm. Like just never having to touch anything, mm -hmm. which means that the, the, you, can ha like you can have somebody run a builder and it should just do its thing without interference. And that makes this kind of like uh, idea of a verifiable S-bomb based on this kind of technology and to some degree based on what Nix already does, like really interesting and feasible. Uh, thanks for presenting your model. Do you have the slides published? Uh, yes, I'm gonna, like they are part of the talk description okay. and I'm gonna post them in the matrix as well. Thanks much. You're welcome, thank you. Still have time for some more questions if you want. Yes. So a very kind of uh, theoretical question. Um, yeah. If you, um, uh, theoretical and meaning hypothetical, um, yeah. if you could add like, let's say a Nix provenance command to Nix where you pass in a store path or something like that. Um, if, you, if you had the, the lever to pull to change Nix yeah. itself to make this provenance stuff uh, easier yeah. on you, uh, what would that look like? Uh, I'm going to bypass the question and say... Fair enough. Actually, if I could pull the lever, let's put in a generic mechanism that lets you add data about the build process. Arbitrary data, as I, as I described. Because that way, like everybody else, like everything else can be figured out by people independently. You can have, if you want the proof of concept of this, somebody can do it in a closed loop on their own system where it's easy for them to generate remote attestations. They have a lot of control over the environment and they, do, they write both the consumer and the producer of this data and, maybe, and, and for them it will be easier right, to do this. And it doesn't have to be done in Nix. We just have to have like, interfaces for extension 
And the same with any kind of verification tool. You just have to like read a transparent, like you just have to ingest a transparency log or uh, ingest those signatures with those modifications. There's no need for official tooling support. And like you can figure out your own semantics for it independently of other people and like the best concept can win. Mm, thanks a lot for your talk. Um, my question is about uh, bootstrapping the trust if we think about remote attestation, I guess yes. we have to trust the TPM, we have to trust that the system has secure boot yes. and so on. Um, have you thought about, or do you think it might be possible to also use confidential computing, like SJX enclaves and stuff like that to build um, and have a, maybe, yeah, I mean, then we are trusting Intel, okay, but it's maybe a bit easier to trust just the CPU than the whole system? Yes, I think that this is a, a very like, good approach to take. And specifically, if we, if we go for this, which is a really sophisticated high goal, we can have redundancy in those mechanisms. We don't have to trust one vendor implementation. We can say, well, let's trust SGX in combination with this other thing that's totally independently developed. And if, as long as they agree about this relationship between inputs and outputs, that's our barrier for trust. This is a really high barrier, but that's one concept, for example. So, and yeah, that's a uh, great, um, great application of that technology, I think, yeah. Thanks for the question. To everybody, thanks for the questions. Oh, there's some hand here. Uh, I think your point, thank you, by the way, your point about making it extensible so you can do anything is very well made. Uh, Thank you. Have you considered maybe uh, kind of in, in line with SGX or something, just using like zero knowledge proofs to verify dependency resolution, just that part of it or something like that? Have you looked at that at all? Uh, not specifically, de like dependency resolution. Mm, I haven't thought about it. It's an interesting idea. So I haven't thought about it. I'm thinking about it now, so thanks. Um, and like, I'm not, sh there are concepts of building actual hardware that's kind of very, or like building the, conceptually building hardware that you can verify in that way. And I, I think like next to the, um, to the like trusted computing way of doing things, this uh, zero knowledge proof way of doing things is even more <laughs> like, it's, it's another way to go. It would be really interesting. I wonder how practical it is. It's an it's interesting thing to look into. Yeah, I agree. It, it's very slow. Yeah, OK. <laughs> OK, so thank you, everybody, for your time. It's great to talk to you. <laughs>